So you hopefully you watched the parental and 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 the true breeding cross video, and you know that at this point Mendel has already created a first generation, which all looks like the dominant parent. Now at this point he already realizes that the blending theory doesn't make any sense because if it made sense you would have seen something that actually is a mixture of both parents not the look of one parent dominating all right so he already figures out that there's more that he needs to do here so what he does next is that and by the way what this drawing is showing you is that by combining two two different true breeding parents like you see that they look alleus you're actually going to make all hybrids carrying both genes but showing only the dominant gene which takes over right and you also realize that these arrows are showing you that those gametes could go to each or one of those flowers and that's all random and and that's what we've been talking about with the whole law of segregation thing now what he does next is he gets those children from that cross and crosses them with each other and also with themselves. They do this, they do a, he does a self-cross. So he does both a cross-pollination between the children of, of, the, of the parental cross, which are the F1 generation, and then he, they get that, or he gets a, a child and crosses it with itself. Either way, he got the same results, you know? which proved to him that all those flowers were the same, basically. All those children were exactly the same flowers because they all did the same thing, whether they did it by themselves or with each other, the result was the same. And then he gets something completely different. Now he's going to get three flowers that look dominant, but here's the weird part. The white color that had disappeared in the, that generation comes back two generations later. So you see how the white fl flower actually went ahead and skipped a generation from here to there. Now that tells him, whoa, hold on a second. How do you go backwards? That doesn't make any sense. If things blend, how do you go backwards? In the previous video uh, videos, we talked about the whole color theory, the idea that you mix the colors and you end up getting all brown. Can you ever get a crown that's mixed and unmix it back to green and yellow? Can you turn green and... Uh, uh, blue and yellow and make green and do something to the green to make it blue and yellow again you can't do that you can't go backwards if you're blending and see how the look comes back here is another proof that there is no such thing as blending and that the particle theory makes more sense that the genes are just recombining and resorting themselves and then when you accidentally reconnect two little guys together the same way that the first original parental generation had you're going to get the same look you had back there but since that look is so rare in the whole scheme of things it only shows up twice in all of this you you call it the recessive look that gets overpowered by the dominant look so let's see how this process actually works by doing a cross that he did now remember he either got two children or that child with itself and he got the same results proving that all children were the same and he Again, we're going to cover pot color, and again, you're going to do the same things for the LUs, the phenotypes, and the genotypes that associated with them. So, except this time, I'm crossing the children of the P cross, which are, is the F1 generation. And they're going to be big G, little G versus big G, little G. And like we've talked about before, they're all going to be green. Now, I do meiosis with this, and that means that first parent there is going to have to donate a, a G over here. And that parent is going to have to go donate a little g over here. So let's see if that happens. Like So one parent, big G, little g. It's going to be the same thing for the other parent. And when I put that on the Punnett square, I'm going to put one big G, one little g, and so forth. Now, when I do this fertilization and I combine gamete here with that gamete up there, I'm going to get big G, big G. Or big G, little g, or big G, little g, or there you have it, little g, little g coming back. And that actually is going to go ahead and look yellow because it only has a recessive gene. And a genotype that only has recessive looks recessive. That's the only way it can look recessive. Now let's list the genotypes that we see. Do you see big G, big G? Yes, you do. Do you see big G, little g? Yes, you do. And you also should see big G, little g, little g. So all three possible genotypes are now present in the offspring of the F1 cross. And you get one that is big G, big G, two, which are big G, um, little G, and one, which is yellow, uh, little G, little G. 
Now, what is the probability of getting a genotype that is big G, big G when you make that cross? Well, one out of four. So 25% chance that you're going to get that. What about uh, this? Well, there's two ways that you can get that. Remember, we talked about probability. So one, two ways out of four. So there's a 50% chance of a hybrid or heterozygous look. How many homozygous recessive looks? Well, there's only one out of four, so a 25% chance. And therefore, a one-to-one -one ratio in genotypes is what you see as a result of the F1 cross. All right? Now, you see both looks coming back. Like we said before, you're going to see three greens and one yellow. So three greens and one yellow. But why three greens? Remember that these three over here all have a dominant big G in it. And therefore, they're going to show up as dominant, showing three out of four. That means for every four children you have, chances are three of them will be green. There's a 75% chance of that, therefore, of, you, of any given child being green. And then for every four children you have, one is probably going to be yellow. Or there's a 25% chance of a, any given child being yellow. And that's why it's recessive, because in the cross, is the least likely of scenarios, because it will only happen when it's by itself or paired up with another one just like it. Now, what do you learn from this? You learn that when you get the F1 generation, or the children of the parental generation cross, or the P cross, or the F1 generation, and make them the progenitors of a cross, and you cross them, you're going to get the F2 generation that looks like this. And the conclusion is that if both parents are carrying both genes and are hybrids, the recessive phenotype returns after skipping a generation, but the dominant phenotype is still more, more prominent than the other one. And it's going to be more common in the population because of that, unless the, that causes a disadvantage to the organism, in which case natural selection is going to select against that and cause the recessive to be more common. It is possible for the recessive phenotype to be more common. For example, it is recessive to not have Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a degenerative mental disorder that causes you to, to uh, actually lose your me mental faculty because fat deposits gather on the brain which and stop the brain impulses from working properly. That is a dominant trait. But we don't see it very often because everybody that has it ends up dying from it. And so it's very rare to see that trait. But it's more common to see the recessive trait. But whenever that trait is present, it shows up. And that's why it's so deadly. Now, dominant traits are very deadly. Usually embryos don't make it. Because if you have a deadly trait that always shows up, how are you ever going to get rid of that, right? But anyways, what is happening here is that a look that went away came back. Therefore, proving that no blending took place. So this is going to be the best cross to show the law of segregation or the law that states that the gametes, during the formation of the gametes, the genetic code separates, half goes to one gamete, half goes to another, just like meiosis explains, and that after they recombine, they don't blend, but they just cause a combined code that determines, depending on the relationships, what you're going to look like. So... Traits that typically skip a generation are going to be recessive traits. And so when you see a pedigree and you see a trait that's skipping a generation, you're going to know it's going to be a recessive trait. And you're never going to be able to return to a blended look if there wasn't, uh, if there wasn't a particle genetics. This cross is the best cross to show the law, to prove the law of segregation. And that's the F2 cross. On our next video, we're going to do the F2. Sorry, the F1 cross. Sorry, this was the F1 cross. On the next video, we're going to get these people, the F2 generation, and we're going to cross them, with, it, them with, it, with each other to create another cross that is the last one of them. So we talked about the true breeding cross, the, F, the parental cross, and the F1 cross, and now we have the F2 cross to finish it up. We'll see, I'll see you then. I know this has been a pattern in every video, but I think I'm done and I remember that I have something else to show you. And so here's another thing to just to add really quick to the, F, the F1 cross video. And this is basically just showing you how it actually looks with the traits in the cross. So you can see that the pods 
uh, are going to be three to one. And uh, just basically a visual Punnett square of what we did on the other screen. And also, this is an overall reveal of what's happened so far. That, you know, that this whole process is happening through the process of segregation of genes that is involving in meiosis. Remember, the separation of homologs is what's causing the segregation of genes. And that you start with the true breeding parents on the P generation, and that the P generation produces all hybrids, which then separate again through meiosis, which because you're going to do another generation. And so you again you create half, grammys, which are half like the parents, and then those will recombinate and create uh, that three to one ratio when you cross it with itself or another one just like it, which is the case of any other offspring of that generation. And then you're going to get a three to one ratio like we talked about. And remember that this is a process that explains the law of segregation and it is tied into meiosis. And remember that Mendel did not know about meiosis, but there's the cool thing about Mendel's work is that when we learned about meiosis, we were like, wow, Mendel really had this right. Even though he didn't know about this, he predicted that this was going to happen. It's quite amazing. And actually, remember that Mendel did this for many, many traits. He looked at all these seven traits and did this over and over again. And every time, the dominant one made the F1 generation look exactly the same. So you see that happening here. The parents cross and you're going to get all the F1 looking just one look, which is the look of the parent, which told him what the dominant trait was. But then when he got those and self-crossed with themselves or crossed them with offspring from the same generation, he got every time, every time, and the after generation, he got a 3 to 1 ratio. Now, notice the numbers here. He actually tried this thousands of times, and he and the ratios that he did were because he needed a lot of data. You know, in science, you always repeat, repeat, repeat to verify. So this is based on the average of thousands of crosses with thousands of Ps of seven years' worth of research. And that when everything is said and done, he got very close to an actual 3 to 1 ratio. And if you get the average of the traits, it's going to be a 3 to 1 ratio. Now, there are several reasons why it's not exactly a 3 to 1 ratio. And we'll talk about that on when we do chromosomal genetics because the genes don't quite work the way Mendel uh, explained it. It's a little thing here and there which causes it to be different. But overall, he, he hit it right in the mark. And you actually see it's hard to deny. By the way, those of you who want to do some creative work, you can actually do what Mendel did. Well, obviously not thousands, but you can do one one set with something that's called Wisconsin's fast plant. So you can get the P generation, cross them, get the F generation, cross them, get the get the F2 generation. So it's really cool. And if you want to do it, you can do it. We can do it in the backyard of the school, and it would, it would be a lot of fun. So that is explained by the law of segregation, which has is tied into meiosis, and we already talked about this, but remember that this is a process that wasn't discovered too much later, but that Mendel definitely hit on the mark, which actually led to the development of the particle theory of genetics, because once you realize the return of the, of the, of the, of the, of the recessive genotype could only be explained by the lack of blending. We talked about this in a previous video, and here it is again. You cannot blend and go back to the previous look. And so Mendel got the idea of two different genes and of two different types of looking dominant and of the idea of polygenetics from these results.